Welcome back to the Brahmin Word, and we are continuing on with the life of Jonah. And here you see his um, his faith continue to just be kind of well, in in a way, out at sea. <laughs> and so he just he continues to just show that as a prophet, he should know what to do. And yet, even though he knows what to do and what to say, he kind of lacks in that department. So with that being said, go back to Jonah chapter 1, verses 7 through 17, as we'll see what it means um, what it means to be saved by the fish, so to speak. Um, is that seen as a, as a grace, as a mercy? We will see that, not just uh, today, but also uh, next time on, on Thursday as we dive into the prayer of Jonah in Jonah chapter 2. But with this, we got to finish up verse chapter 1. So, verse 7. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, and that's the the sailors, that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So verse 7 seems very um, superstitious, uh, very kind of let's leave it up to fate. Well, at that time, a lot of cultures and, and their quote-unquote religions um, were very much very much like that. They were uh, very much so connected with fate and with this idea that uh, the random acts that we see um, maybe aren't so random, which Christianity also shows that the random acts that we quote unquote see are all being understood and uh, God has planned those random acts um, beforehand. So he knows those things beforehand. So it's interesting to see some similarities and differences between world religions and Christianity. So if you get the chance to look at those, uh, it's very fascinating. Uh, but the lot fell on Jonah. So we're not entirely sure what kind of lot. Um, it is most likely with a die. Um, that's most likely what it is. Some have thought maybe it's a kind of a straw thing, like Jonah pulled the short straw or the long straw. Uh, but either way, it fell on Jonah, and so they made an assumption in verse 8. Then they said to Jonah, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? And where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? Um, so these are obvious questions. Now, the question would be, why would these questions be answered in order for Jonah to get on the ship? Um, most likely because he paid enough that he didn't have to have these questions asked. They were happy to take his money and bring him on board the ship. Um, so that's probably why they weren't asked in the first place. Um, but again, because of the culture of the day, whatever lot this was, because it fell on Jonah, they see him as, uh, what did you do? <laughs> and so because of that, they ask, honest questions. And I will give this to Jonah. He does answer honestly in verse 9. And Jonah said to them, I am Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Now, this is a really interesting way that he describes God. It's not wrong. I'm not saying it's, it's not wrong, but it's interesting how he describes it, though. So, you see first that he shows his nationality with being Hebrew. That's probably not that big of a deal um, when it comes to the nationality part, but everything else following it is, which should be connected to being Hebrew. First, I fear the Lord. Um, and fearing here is not just this, I'm scared of him, even though it, as we see in Jonah, there is this level of actual trembling fear, but it's more of a reverential fear as well, which then leads into the description, the God of heaven, which again, you would think if Jonah knows this, then he can't possibly think that going to the west and going towards Tarshish, um, which again is the lower part of Spain, we believe, uh, which at that time was believed to be the end of the world or the, the edge of the world. Even if he does go there, he 
describes God as the God of heaven. So therefore, God would be able to see wherever he goes. And not only that, he says, who made the sea and the dry land. So it doesn't matter whether Jonah is going by horseback or by uh, or by a wagon or a chariot or, or by a boat. He, the Lord has made every bit of square footage that Jonah will be trekking. And yet he still goes and tries to run away from the Lord. And so I think it's interesting how he describes God. Now, of course, the sailors take this in a very, uh, oh my gosh, kind of way in verse 10. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to Jonah, what is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. So it is interesting that he doesn't tell them um, what the, his occupation is or where he comes from or, where, or what his country is or what nationality he is. But he does tell them at the end of verse 10, he has told them before that he was fleeing from God. And so they do know that part. And yet, okay, until now. Now they're like, well, wait a second. And this is a great statement. What is this that you have done? Uh, it's interesting to see that the pagan sailors are more, have a more reverential uh, mindset when it comes to the Lord, or maybe just a trembling mindset when it comes to the Lord than Jonah does. And that's really, really quite interesting, I, I find. Um, and they were exceedingly afraid as well. Um, so they have to come up with some sort of plan in verse 11. Then they said to Jonah, what shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. Jonah said to them, pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet, will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. And so, yeah, it kind of makes sense. But yet the sailors continued to try to save Jonah in verse 13. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Uh, verse 14, Therefore they called out to the Lord. They, I believe, is just the sailors. I don't think Jonah is part of this cry in verse 14. Um, I don't think it's part, I don't think Jonah's speaking here. I think it's just the sailors, which is kind of wild, isn't it? Uh, that these words I'm about to read are just from the sailors. O oh Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O oh Lord, have done as it pleased you. There's a couple things here. So obviously they, they point to the fact that they are an innocent party in all this. They didn't know um, that what Jonah was doing. Yes, they knew he was running away from the Lord, but in a in a uh, polytheistic culture where a lot of things, if not everything, could be pertained to be a divinity, then why should I care that this guy is running away from this quote unquote Lord? Why should I care about that? But then when they find out that is the Lord of Lords, then they're like, ah, uh, that is wrong. <laughs> um, Again, before even Jonah gets to that point, really, which is kind of crazy. But it's interesting as well at the end of verse 14. Uh, For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So it's interesting that even the sailors, the pagan sailors, see that everything that is going on, the, the winds and the storm, and then Jonah being thrown into the sea, that is all done according to the Lord. Um, it, it's quite interesting to see how this is very much a moment of evangelism. Uh, so, But they do go forward with it finally. Verse 15. So they picked up Jonah, hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. So... What's interesting here, obviously, yes, is verse 16, the the transformation of these pagan sailors um, to fears of God and worshipers um, of God, which I believe is the, uh, the point of the sacrifice and the vows, is a worship of the Lord. 
So obviously that's a big point in verse 16. But I think it's also important that exactly what Jonah says will happen, happened. I, I think that's a, a very, a very important point that that has to happen in order for verse 16 to come about. If they throw Jonah overboard and nothing happens and the storm either stays the same danger or gets worse, then the sailors would go, well, then he just made all that stuff up. But instead, as soon as he hits the water, um, the sea ceased from its raging. And as soon as that happens, then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. So once they see that Jonah is telling the truth, I mean, they take his word for it first, but then it's backed up by this action caused by the Lord, not by Jonah. Then they're like, oh my goodness, this Lord is truly God. And that's what then leads to... Um, to the reverential fear, and then to worship as well. So I think that's really uh, important to see. And then finally in verse 17, the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So obviously there is a salvation owed to the fish, uh, to the great fish uh, in verse 17. But I think the verb appointed in verse 17 is probably the biggest part of this verse in verse 17. It's not like God just thought of, oh, let's throw Jonah into the sea. And then, oh, you know what? I'll, I'll send a great fish. No, it, it's, it, it's the fact that he had appointed that. And when did he appoint that? Before Jonah was even born, he had appointed that. And so this is the crazy part about, the crazy awesome part about our Lord. And so with Jonah, I think you see a couple things here. You see first the opportunity that we are given to witness to others. And a lot of the times with our words we do that, but a lot of the times too we can witness to others even in the midst of our own trials and mistakes. Trials that we didn't bring about necessarily, but then mistakes that we did bring about and how we respond to those mistakes can tell folks, look, yeah, Jesus is real. And I know I messed up even as a follower of Jesus, but look, I can run to the cross and confess and repent for my sins because I'm a believer of Jesus. And I long for you to be uh, that way as well. It's not this, look, yeah, um, yeah, you should follow Jesus because he's great. And yeah, I keep messing up all the time. And But I'm not, you know, I, I'm saved, so I'm not going to spend time in, in confession or repentance or any of that because I'm saved, so I get a jail on a free card. It's not how it works. God longs for a relationship with you and I. And part of that relationship is coming to him when we've messed up. One of the great things that being a parent is all about, I'm not one yet, but but one of the great things come, being a parent is about is teaching your children how to respond to the mistakes that they have done. Not like the, the disciplinary part. I mean, that's, don't get me wrong, that's important, but they don't delight in that. Instead, they delight in, uh, parents should delight in the, idea of teaching your children instead how to live a godly life, even in the midst of their mistakes. And I think that's really, really important to see here. And then finally, second, um, the Lord appoints every single thing that happens to us. And yes, that includes the trials, but it also includes the times where he picks us up when we are at our weakest, when we are at our most vulnerable. And when we are at our point where we depend the most upon him and he saves us, whether it is with uh, the encouraging words of a friend, whether it's with the encouraging support of our church, whether it's with um, having us finally find that job, the job that we need, or by sending a great fish into um, to swallow up 
to swallow us up from danger of the sea. And we will see that danger next time on Thursday. And we'll also talk a little bit more about the great fish because, of course, you have to talk about the great fish, right? So we'll get all to that next time on Thursday. Uh, but thanks for spending time with me today as we talked a little bit more about Jonah uh, on the Brahmin word. Thanks.